Welcome to this extra episode of the podcast. In fact, we're going to have to call it We Have More Ways of Making You Talk. Last week, James and I were at the Chalk Valley History Festival. As well as doing our show, oh yeah, it's a show, in front of a live audience, we got to meet some fascinating people. James chatted with Professor Peter Caddick Adams. Some of the things he discovered about D-Day will amaze you, and Peter's book is excellent. Well, um, I'm, I'm here at the Chalk Valley History Festival with my great mate, Professor Peter Caddick Adams. And Peter, you and I, um, gosh, we've been talking about Normandy and chewing the cud on all things World War II for many, many, many years. And I was lucky enough to read your magnum opus on D-Day in chunks as it was being written, hot off the press. And, and, and it's finally out. And I think we've got to be up front about this. This originally was going to be a book on the entire liberation of France, including Operation de Grun in August 1944, the, southern, the invasion of southern France. Um, and you got so much material that you never got beyond day one. I wrote a million words last year in 2018 uh, about Normandy and D-Day. Uh, and the book was originally, as you say, going to be from the 6th of June right up until the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge, which was what my last book was all about. And I just unearthed so much that was new to me. I thought I knew D-Day, and I had to start from scratch all over again. And I never got beyond the first 24 hours. <laughs> but, but knowing you as I do, I can completely understand why. And I think one of the interesting things is that you first went to Normandy as a teenager. You've met Hans von Luck. You've met John Howard. You've met some of the, of the many heroic figures and warriors that took part in D-Day and the Normandy campaign beyond. And you've been treading that ground literally for decades. And treading the ground is the key because that's what you and I, James, have always done. We've walked the ground. And I think that's what distinguishes us from so many other military historians who've done all the work in the archives. They thought about everything. They've interviewed everybody. And they haven't walked the ground. And that's why you and I come up with these light bulb moments that distinguish us, I think, from a great many others because the ground tells all and you suddenly understand why soldiers and generals and their commanders behave the way they do. Well, I absolutely love walking the ground. And I mean, you know, gosh, we've had so many revelatory moments. I remember walking down the valley before the Auburn Hills um, south of, of Rome and having a eureka moment about Mark Clark and the fall of Rome. Um, but let's not go down that cul-de-sac at this particular point because... Oh, no. <laughs> sure, no, 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 no. Uh, but for, an, for, another, for, another, for another podcast. But... Um, what is amazing is just how many things that I didn't know that you have unearthed about D-Day. And it now turns out that you didn't know either. You just, you just discovered them in the course of your research. So I thought it'd be fun um, for you to list um, 10 things no one knew about D-Day until you'd written your book. Well, I'm, I, actually, I'm going to upstage you because I'm going to make it 11 because okay, yeah, I had an email we'll an this 11. morning uh, at the beginning of the Chalk Valley History Festival this year we had two wonderful D-Day veterans uh, Joe Catini who drove ammunition trucks ashore on D-Day and Richard Llewellyn who was a navigator standing on the bridge of HMS Ajax yeah, at were, H hour and weren't they amazing and they were fantastic and Richard this morning sent me an email and, and said I'm very pleased to see you're talking about um, whether the Germans could have won and let me tell you something um, we had a plan B. If D-Day had failed, we had a plan about getting as close inshore as possible, picking everyone up, Dunkirk style, and going back across the channel with them. And I had no idea about that. And did neither you? did I. It had never struck me as a question to ask anyone, what were your orders if D-Day failed? And Richard's email this morning provided that answer and you know this is what revelatory moments are all about how about yeah. that how amazing i just do you know i i'm ashamed to admit that when i was doing my research for for d-day and the normandy campaign i just didn't even think to ask that question but i was just writing about d-day and i never crossed my mind either and neither when we had d-day veterans here did i ask them and it popped up in an email this morning well it just goes to show because people say you know what possibly can there be new to say about D-Day or the Battle of Britain or the Dams Raid or whatever it might be. And here we are. We now know there's there's not just 10 things, there's 11 things at so the very least. Go. Okay, so 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 the extra one, and let's, let's say that's Richard Llewellyn's point rather than yours. Uh, absolutely. Because it's not in, it's not in um, Sand and Steel, your magnum opus on D-Day. But you've got 10 others. Uh, absolutely. Which are in Sand and Steel. So, um, 
Fact well, one. Thinking about nautical things still, um, it's not just the American, uh, the British and the Canadian navies off uh, D-Day providing warships. There's a whole host of others. Uh, and we forget that nations like uh, Poland provided a cruiser uh, and a couple of destroyers off the D-Day beaches, firing inland on the Germans at H hour. And I think, you know, I, I always feel that the Poles need as big a shout as possible. Uh, and although their armoured division appears later on, um, they're there in the spirit and, and strength uh, and physical manifestation of their warships at H hour on D-Day. Yeah, the Poles, definitely the surviving Poles who've managed to sort of keep fighting after 1940. Wow, do they punch above their weight. Exactly. In, in whatever field it might be, it's whether so it's important. casino, whether it's um, uh, off D-Day, whether it's in the air with the RAF, whatever. I mean, you know, they really do. And, and this is, you know, if you like Poland's finest moment during the Second World War, because the week before, they've been instrumental in liberating Monte Cassino. Yeah. And yeah. so they're, they're not only beating the Germans, but on two fronts, yeah. in Normandy and Italy, simultaneously. And what about that? I mean, there aren't many nations yeah, that no, can that, that to is remarkable. That. that is remarkable. So that's, that's, that's unknown fact one. So fact two is the, the, the D-Day business, if I can call it that, can be traced back to Cornelius Ryan yep. writing The Longest Day. Yes. Um, and uh, that is why Saving Private Ryan, of course, is called Saving Private Ryan. The, the original soldier that this is modelled on, Fritz Nieland, sounded too German, so Steven Spielberg had to find uh, a name that was less Germanic, and so he uses the name of the man who started the D-Day business. But that's not my fact. Cornelius Ryan... That's quite a good fact, though, to be fair. Fact. Cornelius Ryan flies over the D-Day beaches in a B-25... Uh, on D-Day morning. Mm. But it has engine trouble, it returns to base, and he's really, really not. But he then flies out in the afternoon and gets a much better impression of what's going on, writes the story up. As a result, because it's fresher and it's more vivid, because everyone else has, has been in the early morning murk uh, and does, doesn't really know what's going on, he writes the freshest, newest copy. It gets front page treatment in the Daily Telegraph, which is the, the paper he's, he's a Irish, journalist for. He? He's an Irish, uh, Irish journalist. Uh, and so... He, that billing on the front page of the Daily Telegraph on June the 7th is what stirs his imagination. And for the next 15 years, he's collecting eyewitness accounts. And that results in The Longest Day, the book of 1959 and the film of 1962. And that's how it all starts. Yep. The engine trouble in the morning that would never have given him that view and publicity that he then gets in the afternoon. Amazing. So I'm going to put in my own little Cornelius Ryan thing because um, all his papers, I'm sure you know, are at the University of Ohio in, 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 Athens, uh, in Athens, Ohio. And um, they've recreated his office as it was in one of the rooms oh, of the library. And on the desk is Tojo's um, turtle shell um, uh, uh, cigarette box. Wow. Because he went to see... Um, Tojo's house after Tojo had committed Harry Carry or whatever he did to kill himself and half inched it and put it in his pocket and there it is and it's still there so he's a towering figure because of course he also writes uh, about the longest uh, about uh, a bridge too, too far, far and, and also about the, the last, last days battle. of Berlin as well exactly so he's a very important figure to us okay so that's fact two um, so um, the third fact, really, and it's quite appropriate here at Chalk Valley that we've got lots of um, American and German armour uh, in front of us as we speak. Uh, and we think of H hour, particularly on the American beaches, as not involving any of the funnies, the specialised armoured vehicles uh, that belong to uh, um, the uh, 79th, 79th Armoured Division. Um, and these are British creations, and the received wisdom has always been that we offered them to the Americans uh, for their engineers, and they turned them down thinking that American brawn would replace British brain. Yep. Um, and I found in the War Office, in the, in the public record uh, uh, in the um, National Archives in Kew, uh, letters from the War Office offering these to the Americans, the Americans accepting... Um, Bradley writes about using British funnies on Omaha in the assault wave, followed by American troops, so American, uh, British crude armoured vehicles. Mm. So they fully embrace the idea. And why they don't have them in the end it is nothing to do with the Americans. It's all to do with the British, unable to supply enough before D-Day. Well, they, I, yeah, that's, a, that's a great fact. Um, fact four is here we are in a chalk valley. Um, and uh, Bower Chalk, just down the road, was the home of uh, a very well-known local uh, English teacher 
uh, who worked in Salisbury called Bill Golding. And Bill Golding inflicted misery on generations of school kids because he wrote the Lord novel of the Flies. Lord of the Flies that we all had to study um, for O-level or A-level or whatever it was. But on D-Day... Sub-Lieutenant William Golding, Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve... Was on a rocket barge. Was on a rocket ship, uh, an LCTR, firing rockets off Gold Beach at the German defenders. Um, And the first piece of writing he ever does is all about the darkness of uh, ships cascading through the air, Catherine wheels of fire, bodies floating around, and that's the darkness that pervades Lord of the Flies and all the other things he wrote. Brilliant. Now, that comes on very neatly to another aspect of, of D-Day and casualties, and this, I think, is... Um, rep- I'm the first person to have uncovered this, which is when you tot up all the D-Day casualties, we now think the total of people killed killed on D-Day is just over 4,400. Uh, when you look at the preceding year of how many people were killed in pre-invasion exercises, my total... It's five and a half thousand. Wow. Yeah, that's a good one. You look I mean, obviously, the... that's over all the training period rather than just one day. But yes, that is a really good statistic. And it's never cropped up because it's spread amongst the American, Canadian and British armies, different divisions, different corps. Yeah. Uh, trickling through each month, a battalion loses five here on an exercise. Yeah. Someone walks into a minefield, someone drowns in an amphibious invasion, yep. assault, uh, all those sort of things. Uh, and no one has ever done the maths before. And it, it's, you know, the, the headline point is that more people die in practicing for D-Day than on D-Day itself. That's amazing. But it also kind of underlines, I think, the, the, the seriousness of the training exercises. You know, the, this, this is not lightweight stuff. You know, people are doing doing it sort of as, as close to real as they possibly can a lot of the time. And, and, you know, this underlines the point that we got the training for D-Day exactly right because those casualties would have happened on D-Day and perhaps far it been magnified even more and it goes back to the discussion you ha- you and I had on the first day of the festival about Montgomery the Marmite general yeah and how he was actually very very good at training yeah because and and, and this casualty bill emphasizes it there's no way round that high casualty bill unless you yeah. want it on the day itself and it yep. would have been even worse yep that's a good one well the, the, the next uh, fact is I found absolutely fascinating. Of the American paratroopers who uh, jump into Normandy on D-Day, Joseph R. Burl has a, a, an interesting future because he's captured almost immediately uh, landing into uh, Saint-Marie-du-Mont, um, part of the 101st uh, Airborne Division. Um, he's sent back through the chain and ends up in a prisoner of war camp right uh, on the, uh, sort of in East Prussia. Um, and in April 1945, he escapes and walks towards the advancing Russians. He meets a tank column commanded by Russia's only senior female tank commander. Um, uh, they happen to be Shermans. He understands Shermans, uh, persuades them that he's the genuine article, uh, and joins this tank unit and fights with them. That's amazing, isn't it? And eventually he's wounded in combat, ends up in a Russian field hospital. Zhukov, who's visiting, is puzzled. And how does he communicate with these guys? He has picked up enough German... Uh, he's of German descent. Okay. Um, and he's picked up enough Russian from the Ukrainian prisoner of war camp guards. So, and, he, and, and so with a mixture of German and Russian, he manages to communicate. Yeah. Um, he's Go also, forward fire. He's also very wisely picked up his prisoner of war... Um, camp cards somehow so he's got evidence that he's a a genuine prisoner so he fights with this unit um, and he understands explosives backwards Um, so they understand he's the the real deal familiar with American equipment and and armour fights with this unit into into Berlin he's wounded ends up in a Russian field hospital where Zhukov clocks him uh, and says what are you doing here Uh, and he's then suspicious so he's checked out in the American embassy um, and then eventually repatriated to the United States, where it's found that a mass has already been said in his honour. <laughs> He's been effectively buried, yeah. tombstone, the whole work. The so man he, who came back from the dead. Absolutely. And the story has a, an even curiouser twist, because he then is the only American credited with fighting in the West and the East. He has a full set of Russian medals. He does tur- he? So he, he does get his gongs. He gets his gongs. He turns up uh, at May Day uh, ceremonies on, uh, or, or Victory Day ceremonies each 9th of May in the Kremlin. 
and his son in due course becomes US ambassador to Moscow. How brilliant. That, and that that's quirk a trivial of fate. One. I really, really like that one. That's a really good one. So a, brief, a more brief, briefer one now, if we go back to the, the, the Cotin Town, um, the, the first two senior officers killed during the course of the Normandy campaign both die in the early hours of, of D-Day. And one is Brigadier General Pratt uh, of the 101st Airborne Division, who's killed when his glider uh, has a really hard landing and he, sitting yep. in his glider, um, uh, has his neck broken and, that, of course, features in the film uh, yep. Saving Private Ryan. Um, but uh, a little further north, the 82nd Airborne ambush uh, a German general. Yes, he's racing Lieutenant back to Malcolm his, Brannan. Um, exactly. And he's returning to the Chateau de Berneville, which yep. we know and we've visited, yep. home of the Normandy Institute. Yep. And General Fally, uh, yep. Wilhelm Fally, commander of the uh, 91st Airborne uh, Luftlander Division. Who, who, who goes out in, um, in early on the 5th of June trying to get a, an early start on a field exercise, uh, on, a, on a map exercise that's going to take place in Rennes the following day. Exactly. And that he's been told, hasn't he, by Max Pemsel, who's the Chief of Staff of Seventh Army, not to go, but he goes anyway. And comes a cropper. And comes a cropper. And ironically, what was the exercise going to test? It was going to test German reactions to an Allied airborne assault of Normandy. Yep. So that's and, a good one. And that's what does for him. Okay, so go, go, we, we've looked at the Allies uh, a lot, but um, what about the Germans? Well, most of the Germans, 20% of the German army in Normandy, the German 7th Army, aren't German. That's brilliant. They're Poles, they're Czechs, they're Ukrainians, yep. they're, they're the Volksdeutsche. Mm. Um, and so they, the Ost battalions. The Ost battalions. Uh, and, um, and they don't want to be there, and they're not interested. Absolutely, and so that that undermines their fighting spirit, but it also provides all sorts of difficulties because the Germans don't have, no, don't know how to command them. Because yes, of and words at Omaha command. Beach there is one particular bunker. I think it's on on Strong Point seventy or, um, or something like that, um, where the the hospital, the Russians actually kind of okay, sod this for a for a laugh, and they actually shoot the the uh, German NCO and there's a bit of an insurrection and one other German NCO runs across to sort them out, gets killed in the process. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the famous penetrations off Omaha Beach is a load of men snaking their way up the, the bluffs uh, and they come across a lone machine gunner and they take him prisoner uh, and he turns out to be a Pole uh, and the leader of the American patrol going off the beach is also of Polish extraction. So they have a conversation and that's how they roll up the German defences pole to pole. Brilliant. In that particular sense. Yeah, sector. that's amazing. So there we are. We've done eight. Um, let's let's our, our ninth. We we need to include an, another nationality. Yep. Which are the Canadians yep. in June. Another Beach. another another nation that punches massively above its weight in Hugely. World War II. Usually, and I'm very worried they get left out of the D-Day story. I agree. Anyway, I'm I'm focusing on one, one individual captain in the uh, uh, Canadian Royal Artillery uh, lands on Juno Beach that morning. During the evening, he's forgotten a password and he's shot by one of his own men who's jumpy uh, and it's his fault he's forgotten the password. Uh, and he loses part of his hand in the exchange of fire and is immediately Kazavak'd, invalided back to the United Kingdom. Uh, after the war, he can't pursue a, a whole range of jobs and he becomes an actor. Uh, and he has to act with either one hand behind his back or nonchalantly in a pocket. Uh, and everybody listening will probably know who this is, although they, you may be foxed and trying to puzzle this out on your own. I'll put you out of his misery. His name may not clock, uh, uh, ring any bells to begin with, James Montgomery Doohan. But James, you know him better as... Scotty. Scotty, the From engines Star Trek. will not take him, my dilithium crystals, Captain. Yeah, and that all was that. His, uh, his baptism of fire. Uh, and then finally, we had a very good talk yesterday about uh, the fighting spirit uh, and alcohol in the service of soldiers. Uh, and it plays a role on D-Day. Every landing craft uh, takes soldiers ashore uh, and at the back there's a stone rum jar to issue rum to all the um, British and Commonwealth troops just to give them that added little bit of spirit, literally and metaphorically. Um, there's one landing craft where all the soldiers are too seasick or just not interested in alcohol. So the sailors tuck in. Uh, and one of the Royal Navy's more ignominious casualties on D-Day is the sailor who's stretched back on board his uh, assault ship legless because he's <laughs> drunk everybody else's rum. Yeah. Bravo. Well, those are all, those are 10 plus one from Richard Llewellyn. Amazing facts. So thank you. And we've got a copy of Sand and Steel, your absolutely magnificent tome on D-Day. Definitive account, almost, 
There's no such thing as a definitive account, of course, but almost definitive account, game-changing account of D-Day itself uh, to give away to one lucky listener. And lucky listener and everybody else, um, the the book Sand and Steel it has three aims in mind. It's such a doorstop, you can indeed use it as a doorstop. Um, <laughs> it's over a thousand pages and weighs a ton, so you can use it for weightlifting. Yeah. Um, and that's if uh, you don't want to read it in the first place. But if you do want to read it in the first place, and you, everyone should because it's fantastic, then you're going to be, uh, your knowledge of D-Day will be greatly, greatly enriched. Uh, and supplemented only by your own history of <laughs> uh, the rest of the campaign from D-Day onwards. Well, you, but, but that's very kind of you. But this is all about you, Peter, at the moment. So um, let, let's stick to stand and seal. But thank you very much. 